2 Timothy, you guys who were at that conference uh, a couple weeks ago, you got a good outline of, that, uh, of, that, of the letter to Timothy, the second letter to Timothy, an understanding of uh, some of the things that are written in a conference with four teachings. You can't go through the whole letter. Passages from each chapter were given, and I know it was a rich, rich time. But one of the things I want to do, I want to share with you a little bit uh, about what this letter is all about. One of the things that we find here in this letter is the reality that, that Paul is writing to Timothy as a young pastor in the churches in, over the churches in Ephesus, that as he is in that position, as young Timothy is in that position, he's being encouraged by the Apostle Paul to stay true to the Word of God because of the reality of false teachers, because of the reality of bad doctrine which was coming into the churches. And so Paul is writing time and time again, I have received from Christ, I am giving to you. You stay true to what I am giving to you because what I'm giving to you, I've received from God himself. I mean, time and time again, that's the basic thrust of what we see taking place here. A, a, a lot of false teachings going around, a, a lot of questioning taking place. And we see here in this passage, Timothy being encouraged by the Apostle Paul to continue. And what I want to do with you this evening is, is I want to really emphasize this idea of continuance. Uh, I want to encourage all of you, if, if you are not at that men's conference, uh, go on the church's U YouTube page, click on all those teachings. I didn't see them all. I, I, I did look at, at uh, Pastor Sandy, Sandy Adams' teaching on this particular chapter, the third chapter. It's an excellent, excellent teaching which speaks of, of the truth of God's word, the reality that it is inspired by God, that it is God-breathed, all the, the things that have to do with it in terms of the truth of, of, of what it speaks and the value of God's word too. It's just a tremendous, tremendous teaching. I will be hitting on that to some degree tonight, not as heavily as he did, and I would encourage you to take a look at that because it's well worth listening to. I am going to place a greater emph uh, um, emphasis than he did on the first portion of this passage and continue on to those last verses. Paul, in writing, uses these words, but you must continue. Have you noticed all the times that Paul, in the writings of his epistles, uses this little three-letter word, but. I love it. Because what Paul is doing is saying that this is the condition, this is what you see, this is what's in the world, this is what we're hearing from the world, this is what is a part of the flesh, all those kinds of things, but then he uses the word, but. Look at the first word in this chapter. But. But know this. Look at verse 10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine. And here, verse 14, but you must continue. It's this contrasting word in which the, uh, the Lord, through the Apostle Paul, is setting up what is actually going on, the, the dangers that are there, the lies that are being told, the, the practice of the false teachers, and the way that they are leading. He says, but you, you be different. And one of the overwhelming things that Paul is writing here in this second letter to, to Timothy is the reality that the world is bad, the church is facing challenges, there are perilous times ahead, and certainly we now are in those perilous times. Wouldn't you agree? And as Paul is writing that, he's saying, he is saying as bad as it is, it ain't going to get better. It's going to get worse. Evil will grow worse and worse, he writes. And we see that in our world today. It's one of the conversations that just takes place on a weekly basis that I have with somebody. It's just the, the reality of how bad the world is today. But what Paul is specifically teaching is the reality that within the church... Evil within the church is getting worse and worse from the perspective that there is more and more and more 
false teaching. More and more lies being told. More and more people who are being drawn away from the truth of Jesus Christ through their own stories and their own tales. And, and we see at the end of this, ch- of this letter, as we get into the fourth chapter, the verses following what we're looking at tonight, Paul dealing with those particular issues as well. So it's a very, very important letter. But these verses that we're looking at tonight, guys, these verses we're looking at tonight, you know, I, I, I kind of chuckle inside right now as I'm thinking, this is a very, very important letter. Like the letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is not an important letter, right? I mean, every word of the word of God, every word of scripture is inspired by God. Every word is important. But even as I say that, these words are critical because it speaks of the reality of that which I just said, that all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is inspired by God. But as we look at the beginning of this, this, this uh, passage, verse 14, we see as Paul says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned. We see that Paul gives the reason why he needs to continue. But let's look at that just for a moment. But you must continue. As we see the reality of Paul writing these particular words, but you must continue, it is mindful of the fact that throughout the New Testament, this idea of continuing on or abiding, by the way, this is the very same word in the Greek language, meno, that we find being translated as abide so often in the letters and in the gospel of the Apostle John. It is, this word is used over 120 times in the New Testament. More than half of the time, it is the Apostle John who uses it. It's one of his favorite words. And among the, uh, among the words that Jesus used in his departing words to the Apostles in the upper, upper room Discourse, John chapter 15 in particular, which we will be looking at in just a few moments. But you must continue in the things which you have learned. There is value to the word of God. Would you agree with that? There is great value in the pages of scripture. Would you agree with that? Let me ask you a question. Well, before I do, let's look at a couple of other passages. A couple other passages that I want to that I want to take you to. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Turn there with me. Colossians chapter 2. Just a few pages before where we are right now, it's before 1 Thessalonians. Colossians 2. A couple of the verses there in that particular chapter. Verse 3, speaking of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You guys realize that that it is in Jesus, nowhere else, in Jesus, where we can find all the treasures, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Amen? In Jesus. Not in the wisdom of this world, in Jesus. Go down to verse 9. Verses 9 and 10. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Now we are very familiar with the reality of spiritual warfare, aren't we? Spiritual warfare is real. There is a devil. He leads a host of demons who follow him. Now, something that's good news is the reality that, as John writes in Revelation, that he, uh, as that letter is given to him, 
It is spoken that he saw the tail of the serpent take the angels out of heaven, taking one-third of the angels, bringing them to the earth. That is one-third of the host that God had created that became demons. That's what we have around us, one-third that Jesus created. Two-thirds remained in service to our God. That means there are two angels for every demon. I like that. I like that. But aside from that, and even of more importance, is the fact that greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Amen. We've always got to remember that. Because there is spiritual warfare. We are constantly being bombarded. But we have the strength of the creator of the universe within us. And we can endure. Amen? Amen. Those are things that we need to remember. <laughs> things we need to remember. Jesus is the head of all principality and power they will bow to him now notice this the beginning words of verse 10 you are complete in him you are brought to full completion or full maturity in Christ nowhere else you can be all that you can be, not in the army, but in Christ, only in Jesus. No place else we can go to find complete fulfillment as a human being, as a creation of God. Jesus and Jesus only. We are complete in Him. And we find what He gives to us through the work and power of God's Holy Spirit as he enlightens us in regard to what the word actually has to say about Jesus and as we relate to him and found, uh, form a relationship with Jesus, we find that in our intimacy with him, in our abiding with him, it is only then that we find ourselves in that place of completion. But it is through the abiding in Christ. We're complete in Him. Turn with me to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, a, a, a psalm that is familiar to many of you. One which is, well, it just shares some tremendous truths with us. Psalm 19, beginning in verse 7. The entire psalm is incredible. But I want, I want to begin in verse 7 through verse 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes. All those words being used, the law, the testimony, the statutes, the commandments, different ways of basically referring to the word of God. They, it is perfect, it is sure, it is right, it is pure. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Yea, than much fine gold. I don't know how much gold you may have in your own personal portfolio. What is God saying about the value of that gold in comparison with what you guys have on your lap right now? What's God saying? This is more valuable. We know that we can collect all the gold in the world. 
But come judgment day, we still have to face our maker. And that gold's going to burn. It is the word of God which will endure forever. Guys, you have on your laps right now the most valuable possession of all. Of all that you possess, you own nothing more important nor of greater value than the Word of God. Would you agree with that? I was expecting a much more rousing applause than that. I really was. Guys, I'm telling you. I'm tell That's better. That's better. That's better. You know, do you love the Bible? Do you read it daily? Do you devour it, even as Jeremiah wrote of doing? Is it something that is a part of you? Is it something that God is actually writing upon the tablets of your own heart? Is it something that you carry with you every single day? Is it something that you know that you cannot live without? It, it's got to have that place in our hearts. Now turn with me over to Proverbs chapter 2. <laughs> I'm taking a little bit of a different approach than Pastor Sandy did at the men's conference in regard to speaking of the value of God's word. I mean, Sa Sandy did a, a, a great job as he spoke about the four different ways that the word of God came to us through inspiration, through canonization, transmission, and translation. How many of you guys were at that conference? Raise your hand. A, a good number of you, good. Maybe about... Less than a tenth of who are here, though. Um, but he did a great job with all those things. As we look at the Word of God and see the value that God himself places as he speaks to his people in writing, the Word of God is incredible. Proverbs chapter 2. Follow along as I read. You know, I, I want to quickly, and we're going to go ahead and do this. I'm, I'm going to read through the entire 22 verses. <laughs> Proverbs 2, the entire 22 verses of this chapter. I'm going to go through it quickly, but things in it that are just absolutely incredible. Listen to what God says to us through Solomon, the writer of this proverb. My son, if you receive my words and treasure, here we go, and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then, notice this, if we do all those things of the first four verses, then, if we value God's word like that, and seek it like that, then, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. You guys want God to do that for you? Then we've got to seek God's word, hide it in our, into our hearts, and we must regard it as a treasure that is hidden. And we, might not, we must not stop cultivating it, searching for it, and continuing to place God's word in our hearts. That's what we've got to do. Then we have these incredible blessings. God will be a shield he guards our paths. He preserves our way. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good 
path. And I'm going to stop right there. Read the rest of it when you go home, okay? Just an incredible, incredible proverb. But again, speaking of the value of God's word. The value of God's word. So because God's word is what it is, because God's word does what it does, it does so much for us. So much it does for us. A couple things I want to mention to you that it will do for, for us. God's word heals us, according to, to Psalm 107, 19. Keeps us pure, Psalm 119, verse 9. Keeps us from sin, Psalm 119, 11. It is, a, it is living and it discerns our hearts, Hebrews 4.12. It brings life to us, Psalm 119.93. Also Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47. Notice all the times I'm mentioning Psalm 119. Read what Psalm 119 on a regular basis. The longest chapter of the Bible, but speaks of the virtues and the value of God's word for us today. Brings revival, Psalm 119, verses 107 and verse 25. Brings hope, Psalm 119:49. Brings comfort, Psalm 119, verse 50. Brings strength, Psalm 119, 28. Brings mercy, Psalm 119, 58. Brings peace, Psalm 119, 165. Reveals the way of truth, Psalm 119, 30. On and on and on and on and on. And we must know that God's word will only do that for us and to us as we seek it the way that Proverbs chapter 2 describes. Now, back over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter 3. We find, as Paul writes, but you must continue. You must continue. I mentioned that that word continue is the word abide. It's the same word that is translated as abide. You must continue in the things which you've learned. Well, what's it mean to abide? What does it mean to continue? There are various ways that this word is actually translated in the New Testament. It is translated as Abide or remain or stay. Translated as continue. It's translated at times as dwell. It is related to the idea of an abode. We have an abode in him. It's a place where we actually live and stay and continue. The idea brings the thought that it must be our lifestyle. And we never stray from that. Never stray from the lifestyle of dwelling in the Word of God and the Word of God dwelling in us. Never stray from what it is that God has for us. And Paul tells Timothy, you must continue. This is an imperative. It is a command. And the word must is used to emphasize the command. You must do this, Timothy. Come on, Timmy, you've got to do it. You've got to stay there. You've got to continue. You have no choice. There is no option. If you are going to continue to grow strong in perilous times, if you're going to be a man of God, used by God, in the way that he wants to use you, and the way that you want to be used by him, you must, you've got to continue, you've got to stay, you've got to remain in the things which you have learned. What had he learned? Well, we see those things coming, following after. But guys, there is a value to God's word that we cannot underestimate. In her book, Amazing Grace, the writer and poet Kathleen Norris shares what she calls the scariest story she's ever heard about in regard to the Bible. She said that she and her husband were visiting a man named Arlo, who was a rugged, self-made man who was facing terminal cancer. During their visit, Arlo started talking about his grandfather, who was a sincere believer in Christ. The grandfather gave Arlo and his bride a wedding present, 
an expensive leather Bible with their names printed in gold lettering. Arlo left it in the box and never opened it. But for months afterward, his, father kept, his grandfather kept asking if he liked the Bible. Arlo told Norris, the wife had written a nice thank you note to him, and we thanked him in person. But somehow he couldn't let it lie. He always had to ask about it. Finally, Arlo grew curious enough to open the Bible. The joke was on me, he said. I finally took that Bible out of the closet, and I found that Granddad had placed a $20 bill at the beginning of the book of Genesis and at the beginning of every book. Over $1,300 in all. And he knew I'd never find it. Now, as we've already discussed, we find much more than just simply $1,300 of worth in the Word of God. Amen? But unless we crack it open, unless we read it, unless we get, in our, get it into our hearts, it is valueless to us. Valueless to us. We'll speak on more, more about that in just a few minutes. Turn with me over to John chapter 15. John 15, which is a beloved chapter in the New Testament, it is what we might call, if there is a chapter that speaks about abiding, that's it. Jesus speaks of himself as the true vine, and we as his followers being the branches, connected to the vine, finding our life source in the vine, right? Right? Look at some of the things that are said here. I'm just simply going to read beginning in verse 5. Actually, I'm going to begin in verse 4. No, let's go back to the first. No, the first four. First four. Jesus says this, Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine... You are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so, or in this way, you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in in his love. Note the importance there in verses 9 and 10 in terms of the relation between keeping the commandments of God and abiding in the love of Christ. Note that. If we have if we if we take God's word seriously, if we take holiness seriously, if we take obedience to God seriously, some, even within the church, will say, you know what, you are just being too legalistic. You're taking the commandments too seriously. We're saved by grace. Now, I'm not going to argue with that. The Bible says we are saved by grace, Ephesians 2.8. Through faith, and not of, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Yes, we are saved by grace. But we grow also by grace, but in a particular way that God has designed for us, and it is through the word of God. We are, we are brought close to Christ through the word of God. 
Shortly before these words, on the same evening, Jesus speaking to the apostles, chapter 14, verse 15, something very familiar to most of you, Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. And the idea of keeping God's commandments is more than obeying God's commandments. Obedience is a part of what it means to keep the word of God. Keeping, it's, it's basically a military word which speaks about guarding. It's a word that would describe what a sentry does when he's on watch. Guarding the entrance to the camp. It is important that he's there. What he's guarding is extremely important because if he doesn't, it could reap great destruction to his comrades in war. You keep that, you guard over that, you, you regard as valuable and so you treasure it, you, have, you, you might hide it, you protect it, you keep it. And if the word of God is important enough to us to guard it and to keep it and to treasure it and to make sure everybody knows how important and how valuable it is, we do that by obeying it. Because, see, through our disobedience to the word of God, we basically are showing our lack of regarding it as important. We're telling other people that, no, God's word isn't important. I like this verse, but I don't like that one. Pastor Sandy the other day did a, did a wonderful job with that idea. He, he spoke about um, Pandora. You know that, that music app on your smartphones? And you can type in you know, a group, you know, the Beatles or whatever. That, that's what I might do. Um, and then it, it will play all the music that you want. And, and then as you hear a song, it, it'll, it's got a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I like that one. No, I don't like that one. And it further, you know, uh, uh, customizes your, 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 your music list for you. And, and we do that with God's word. I like that verse. I don't like that one. Oh, you mean I have to work? No, I don't have I don't like that one. You mean I actually have to do something? I have to be diligent? No, I don't like it. Grace? I love it. You know, I mean we we do that. We do that. And we can't. Why? Because all scripture is inspired by God. We cannot pick and choose. E either it is or it isn't. And if we believe that it is, we must apply all that we read. Because it all comes from God. Amen? And we show our love to God by showing others in the world and him too that we, guard, that we regard his word to us because he's God and I'm not. He's wise. I'm a fool. He is incredibly smart. I can get pretty stupid sometimes. He knows. I don't. He is Lord. I'm his servant. When he speaks, I do what he says. Because he is God. That's the attitude that we really need to cultivate in our lives. But we've got this sinful nature in us that, that just rebels against those things. Don't you hate that? Don't you look forward to the day someday, sometime soon when Jesus comes for his church and we are transferred to him, our bodies are changed in the twinkling of an eye and we are rid of this sinful nature? It's happening soon. It's happening soon. And as John writes in 1 John 3, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. So let's make sure we are living a pure life as we 
look for the return of Jesus Christ. There is no option than to continue in the things that we've learned. And as Paul writes this to Timothy, going back over uh, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, the idea of staying and remaining and dwelling there, if Jesus speaking that 10 different times in verses 4 through 10, he used that word abide or continue, remain, stay. Stay there. Don't leave it. And if you do, we will be able to bear the kind of fruit, and he's speaking about spiritual fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, as we see in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. That's the fruit that's being spoken of there. You will bear much fruit. As the Holy Spirit in us, upon us, has his way in our lives. Timothy is to remain in those things that he had learned. Now what he's referring to, what God, or what, what God through the Apostle Paul is referring to here is the Old Testament Scripture because when Paul wrote this, that's what Scripture was. This was before the canonization of the New Testament. Paul was still writing the New Testament when he wrote these words, right? But it's interesting that even Peter... In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, he writes this, And considering that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable, unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of scripture Peter is calling the writings of the apostle Paul scripture that's amazing already within the church before Peter and Paul were executed by Nero Paul's writings were being regarded as Scripture. And of course, through the canonization process, we see it within the Word of God today. Timothy is being commanded that he must, no option, he must stay in the things which he had learned and assured of, knowing from whom he had learned them. We see... Paul making reference to the fact that from childhood he had known the scriptures, the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy had been trained in the Old Testament scriptures from childhood. And it's interesting to note, th this blows me away, guys. Think about this. When Paul writes this, he's writing of the Old Testament scripture. These scriptures, the holy scriptures written by Moses and the prophets and, and, and the, the, the writers of Psalms and Song of Solomon and so forth, all the history books, all the Old Testament, those words are, what does Paul say? Able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the Old Testament is filled with references to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who would come and had come. And that's the good news that Paul is writing about. The fact that the Messiah prophesied of old has come. That salvation has come. The Son of God, the Lamb of God, had come and died for the sins of the world. And the Old Testament is what able to make us wise unto salvation, which is found in Jesus Christ. Interestingly, according to what Paul writes there, we don't even need the New Testament to find Jesus. But I'm so glad that God saw fit that he would 
make sure that we would have these words of the New Testament or the New Covenant, which gives us the life of Jesus, and these letters which follow up, which give us the, the, the letters that speak about Jesus and who he is and what he has done. The book of Acts, which speaks about the history of the church in the first decades after the coming of Christ and the death of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, who still is with us, still resides in us, still comes upon us, and still leads us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just an amazing, amazing truth. I, I love it. I love to see how God uses these things in this way. But not only was it Timothy's mom and his grandma that fed him the scriptures, but we see that Paul is referring to himself as well. Because all through, as I mentioned before, all through this letter, we've got to keep the, these comments within the context of all the letter of 2 Timothy, in which Paul continues to say, I have trained you in the scriptures, these things, like he said, well, well turn over to chapter 2, verse 2 real quick. It's probably one page over. It, it is in my Bible. Chapter 2, verse 2. The things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who you will be able to teach, who will be able to teach others also. The things that I've taught you, because I received them from Christ, teach others, so that they can teach others, so that they can teach others, so that they can teach others. And God saw fit that he would have the words of the Apostle Paul preserved for us, so we don't have to play the telephone game and worry about whether or not by the time we get 14, 15, 16 generations down the line, whether what we're actually hearing is the same that what we began with, God has made sure that we do have that which we began with. Isn't that cool? See, that's what God does. That's what God does for us. Thank him for the word that he's given to us. But he's referring to those things that he himself had, had written as well. Which, by the way, as we combine the, old, the, the Holy Scriptures with the things that Paul now was teaching him in regard to the person of Christ and the gospel of Christ. We see, it just, just reminds me, as it would remind all of us, of what Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. As Paul writes, Now therefore... You are no longer strangers and foreigners. Remember, he's writing to the people of Ephesus, a church that was founded on his visit to Ephesus in the book of Acts, chapter 19. And as we see the reality of this church having been formed from a bunch of Greeks, not schooled in the Old Testament, but Greeks who had worshipped the Greek gods and so forth, he says, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He's the one that holds the church together but there's a foundation that he laid, and he laid it through the prophets and the apostles. What did the prophets and the apostles give to us? The word of God, the Old Testament and the New. The church is built upon the New Testament, but Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone of the building of the church, we ourselves. Isn't it cool to see how this all works together? I love that in regard to God's word. Paul reminds Timothy of what he had learned. Now, as we see in verses 16 and 17, we've talked a lot already about the value of God's word, some of the things that God's word will do for us, and the reason it is valuable, the reason that it does do what it does for us is because it is inspired by God. It is in, in the actual literal translation of the idea of inspiration of God it means God breathed God breathed when God created man 
we know that God took the clay of the earth and formed man. And we're told that God breathed into his nostrils and became, he became a living soul. You know, guys, in the very same way, I mean, it's very similar. God breathing physically, giving physical life to Adam. He breathes his word into our hearts and gives us spiritual life. Isn't that cool? I mean, we are receiving the very breath and the very life of God. Deuteronomy chapter 32, that I referred to that earlier, that we find life through the word of God. In fact, that passage tells us, as, as Moses is speaking to the people of Israel, that the word of God, these, these commandments that God has given to you, it is your life. This is my life. I don't have life without this. Now, could I, could I be standing and breathing and walking around without this? Yeah, I could. I, I, I could live physically. But I would be dead spiritually without this. I would have no relationship with Jesus Christ without this. I would, not, I would have no hope for heaven without this. I would not have life without this. And no one can. It is our life. Now, as we consider these truths, guys, as we consider what God has done for us, what he's given to us, I want to encourage you, meditate on the scriptures. Make sure that you meditate, and then as you meditate, do what the scriptures have to say. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to close with these particular verses, Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at the closing words of the Sermon on the Mount. Words that are very familiar to you guys. Chapters, chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Therefore, Jesus is speaking. I know because the letters are red. Of course, interestingly, actually, actually, my Bible I have is not a red letter edition. So, anyway. Jesus says, therefore. Now, this is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which began at the beginning of the fifth chapter. Chapters 5, 6, and 7. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine. What sayings? All that he just said. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But, oh, there's that word again. Contrast. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Guys, we've got to take note that storms come into everyone's life. Both the person who did the sayings of Jesus and the one who does not do the sayings of Jesus, they went through the same storm. Look at verse 25 and 27. Exactly the same up until the point where we see the result of the storm. Verse 24 and 26. Whoever hears these sayings of mine, the same in both verses. The only difference is, verse 24, the one who heard did those sayings. Verse 26, the one who heard didn't do those sayings. 
This speaks something very powerful to us guys. You can know the word of God and not be protected by it. Because she, you, you see, when we receive the word of God, if we regard it and receive it as what it is in truth, as the Thessalonian church did, receiving it as truth, the word of God, and not the word of man, then because it's the word of God, we believe it's important, and so we keep it, as we were talking about earlier. If you receive the word of God and you don't regard it as important because you maybe believe that, well, maybe some of it's God's word, some of it's, I'm not sure which is what, and, you know, whatever. But you just do whatever you want to do. And so often we as Christians, we find this in the church. It is terrible that we see this in the church, but we see it. We use the grace of God as an excuse for sin. God's grace, brother. Come on, man. Who are you, the Holy Spirit? Leave me alone. And we can say, no, I'm not the Holy Spirit, but he sent me. Here's what he said. You see, it's the word of God, if it is not regarded as the word of God, will not save anybody. The word of God if it is not regarded as the word of God, is not going to get you through the storms of life. It's only when a person sees the word of God as the word of God, applies it as the word of God, obeys it as the word of God, keeps it as the word of God, that there is this power that the word of God inherently has to bring healing, wholeness, protection, and life to the soul who keeps it. But we must regard it as the word of God. Satan knows God's word better than you or I do. He used God's word to tempt Jesus. Always taking it out of context. Jesus used the word of God in proper context as his defense. And the devil fled. The word of God. The word of God. The word of God, the word of God. This is your, this is my, this is our, this is the world's only hope. Let's give it, let's read it, let's digest it, let's meditate on it, let us keep it, and let us preserve it as we follow what God has to say. Amen.